giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. For just a buck, you can be our boss at patreon.com forward slash fun FRC. Pledge your support in September and you'll be eligible to win a Cooler Master MS120 keyboard and mouse set. Let's take some live questions from our audience. Yep, so we did have some live ones, so these aren't really vetted too much. So Danny and Fib, there's for some reason you can't answer it or it's not uh, in the wheelhouse they should. Uh, we can just uh, move on from that. But uh, first question coming from uh, Tetno. Uh, one, one, one says, uh, how do you come up with the max weight per robot? Do you do some tests where you just get, com where you completely destroyed the lander testing its strength or what? So did you do anything like any stories where like maybe the lander failed or, um, anything that might've led up to determining the maximum weight per robot? Yeah. So that actually happened sort of in the reverse order. Um, we knew that we wanted to introduce a, a weight limit for this year. Um, there are FTC robots have sort of balloon a, a couple robots have sort of ballooned in the last few years um there's some osha regulations about what one person can lift by themselves um and so th there was sort of on the table um this being a space game and weight being a huge proponent of space travel it just it, it was the year to do it it was the year that fit um and from a design standpoint on the lander it was really reassuring because we were saying, we don't care what the limit is, pick a limit and we can design a lander to meet that limit. Um, and we were just really like, it worked really well that we had a number. Um, 42 was the number that was kicked around from the very beginning because of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I was just saying nerds. Um, it, yeah, because we're all nerds and dorks here. Um, and so we it, we really knew we had to put you know all of our uh, eggs in the basket of the lander and make sure that it was really good and strong um and so we did um some uh, some weight like dead load testing um we also did some cycle testing and some impact testing um and so there if anybody's really curious on all of the details there's a document on the lander uh product page on, on the animark website where we show all of our notes and we detail sort of all of the weight capacities and all the stuff that we did. But I think Catherine uh, put that in chat. I'll see if I can grab that. Oh, cool. Um, the, the lander can take in a sort of realistic real world. They look like robots kind of weight scenario. Um, the worst loading scenario is when you have two robots exactly on opposite sides. Um, and the ultimate, the, the failure point that we took the robot to was uh, it was like north of 207 pounds per robot. And the, and the lander held there. So the lander was good at 207. And because we only had 25 pound weights, um, when we loaded it up to 232 pounds per side, um, that's when uh, we had a, a critical failure. Some parts broke. Um, so it's somewhere between 207 and 232 per side. Um, but we did test, like, if there were four robots on it, um, and it can actually handle more than that. Um, we put 100 pounds per station on a four-robot loading, um, and it did that no problem. That was, it was really good at that. Um, so that's like a robot at uh, – it's a single robot at, like, 10 Gs. It's two robots at 5 Gs. If you're doing that to my lander, don't. Um, but, yeah, th that – we got really confident when we, you know, saw the results of those tests. We're like, this is so far overkill. This is going to be able to take what we, what the tournaments are going to dish out. So we were like, yep, we can move this into production. Yeah. And that's something that's kind of common in the industry to wait, whatever, have a breaking point way higher than your weight limit. Yeah. Um, so to kind of move on, Grumpback Bill asks, any idea why the two mineral cap was chosen over a three or four mineral possession limit? Um, not to say that it was a complete dart at the wall, um, but sometimes stuff's are dart at the wall. Um, we'd done like with rescue and cascade effect and games with those similar game pieces. We had done carry limits that were a bit higher, like five or six. Um, and so one of the other things that we're trading off is the more the more game pieces that you can carry and the shorter the driving distance is the more cycles the robot the more opportunities for cycles a robot has in the match which means 
the more game pieces you need on the field. And so by having a really short driving distance that we have this year, um, we, we knew we kind of needed to either limit the carry possession or have a, even more game pieces on the field than we already do. And 150 is a big number. And we have to be able to store that within the lander. So it was sort of one of these things that sort of snowballed into our favor of it just sort of felt like the right number um, and kind of it all sort of balanced out. Awesome. Next question coming up. Uh, we do have quite a few, Danny, just a, a heads up. So we'll try to take as many as possible. Um, but we might have to keep some of the responses a little short. Um, so, oh, yeah, I'm long-winded. <laughs> from Australia, uh, says, uh, for an, so in order for all the game pieces to be scored in a match, each alliance has to score two pieces every eight seconds. Pretty sure this is the first game, uh, FTC game, where the game won't be maxed out. Uh, was that something that was part of the design strategy uh, or anything in regards to, uh, or was that in, in, in a sort of consideration? Yeah, they always want to try to design the game so that it is playable from the very first tournaments all the way through to you know the the world championship and so if if robots get all the way through the game and all of the game pieces are spent that's you know there, there's a boring period of yeah, time there happens, while you right? wait for robots to hang it, yeah. it's no fun um so yeah it, it is trying to make sure that the game is playable the whole way through um is something that's very much considered Yeah, for sure. So, do you think, um, let's see. Soap is taken, I think, asked that. Soap is taken, there you go. Um, do you think there will be a rule amendments to hoarding materials in the crater to be sent quickly to the lander? So there were some teams talking about, like, making a robot that's kind of like a 2016 FRC style of just holding all of the materials in their robot and then having, like, a conveyor belt to the lander. I I do not really have any I don't I don't have any good insight on that one. Wait for it to come out, right? <laughs> if it does. If it I mean the best thing that you can do is ask the question in the Q&A and if they'll either the, the game design group will either say like that's a thing that you can do, that's a thing that you can do with conditions or no, don't do that. Fair enough. And that yeah. forum is just open today for the season. Yeah. So cool. So, yeah, make sure you go in there, guys. Once again, anything that's said here is completely unofficial. And, uh, you, you know, regardless, you know, always make sure you get it from the official source in regards to how you could do those answers. And the Q&A is the place to do that. Uh, FRC for Life uh, asked uh, asked about uh, First Global, Danny. Um, the I think the first year that First Global came out, uh, I think you personally had some input in that. And Mark did as well, too, right? Yeah, the, the team at Andy Mark worked a lot on the game field for Global. Um, the, the first year, um, the H2O Flow. Um, one of the, like, I worked on some of the, the early concepting for how some of the, the field thing was going to go. Um, but then it got taken over by some of the other, uh, staff at Andy Mark and, um, the, a lot of the design for the riverbanks and how those actually go together and the internals of those was somewhat significantly left over from what I did. Um, but Nick and some of the other people did a lot more with the bridge. Um, there was a big team that worked on the, the second gen gumball machine, the, the big thing, um, in the top corner under the fun logo that dispenses the balls. Um, that in and of itself is a bit of an engineering marvel. Um, I would recommend that you ask more people from Andy Mark all about that. Um, but at the same time, I don't know that a year has, has is enough time to have passed to get fond descriptions of that thing and then the late nights that it caused. Uh, yeah, it sounds like it. And it was a complicated machine look, just watching it. Um, so Claire EXP asked, I'm leading a new team this year. Any advice for drivetrain design? I would start a lot of the same ways that uh, the a lot of veterans tell you know people to start and that's try to you know get out of the gate and and put as little man hours into your drivetrain as you can so that as so long as it's good and spend your time on the things that like score your points about the game so if it's descending climbing uh you know doing getting minerals out of the crater like whatever that's going to be spend your time on that stuff um the i'm a big fan 
of the tile runner. I think it's fantastic. Um, there are a ton of know-how and experience and all sorts of different things that went into that. It's something that was specifically designed and developed for FTC teams for the FTC competition. It wasn't designed around any one particular FTC game, but just sort of about FTC in general. And each year that it's been out, it's been kind of, it continues to sort of show, you know, it's, it's strength at whatever the game challenge may be. So there's, there's a lot of really cool things in there. There's a ton of know-how and, and years and years of experience that were dumped into that um, through people from the community, the, the engineering staff and Andy Mark. Um, I'm quite partial to it. I think I may have oversold it a little bit. That's okay. Um, it, that's where I would start. Um, you know, there's a bunch of different configurations so you can kind of optimize it for whatever your game strategy is, whatever your plan is. Um, and you can have a lot of fun with it. It comes unassembled. There's instructions for it. It kind of works like a Lego model. You, um, you get to build it and assemble it and put it together um, as you go. Um, but it's, yeah, I would start with the tile runner. Fair enough. Do you have a favorite uh, wheel that you've used uh, throughout the years? Um, so we were actually driving a robot around uh, yesterday, driving uh, up and over craters and stuff. And we were using the four inch uh, black compliant wheel, six of them on a tile runner. And right. as the wheel I, for driving? Yeah. It's wow. the hardest compound uh, compliant wheel that we have. Um, and it is, it's a pretty hard compound, uh, but they, they sort of, they work like suspension. They work like mm. um, pneumatic wheels to any of the, the FRC crowd. Um, pneumatic wheels were the thing for Stronghold. And these wheels, the, the black wheels, they are hard compound wheels. Um, they, they work really, really well. Um, I would not put the green wheels on my robot as a drivetrain option. They're too squishy. Um, but the, the black wheels definitely seem like they hit a little bit of a sweet spot in being able to drive, take abuse, drop your robot from the lander, from 12 inches off the ground, don't care, whatever. Uh, um, just soak up the, the abuse and keep on going. Um, so we, we're starting to run a little bit short on time, guys. So we're going to go through a, a few more questions uh, on here. So we're not going to be taking any more from chat. I think I got all of them uh, as is through, but we're going to go through those. And then if we have extra questions afterwards, I'm sure uh, you can shoot those over to uh, Danny uh, or ask any Mark, or we can try to get responses from those later on. Uh, so uh, question is uh, from uh, uh, from Adam uh, for, from 14875. Asks, uh, can you talk a little about the crater and the design process that went behind that? All right, so that's a that was one of the kind of whiz bang crazy ideas that I had, like going back to the the very early stages of this. There was a, a concept where we were I, I had this idea the GDC guys thought I was crazy. I thought it was going to be really entertaining and totally cool. Um, when you land on a space body, be it moon, asteroid, whatever, you don't exactly know what you're going to land on, where you're going to, you know, what the small scale topography is going to be when you get there. And so one of the earliest designs of the crater was a similar sort of shape to what it is now, except the way that they joined together allowed for a little bit of flex. And so one of the ways that the game was going to be sort of new and innovative um, and clever was that the field was the field setup guide was going to specify how to assemble craters, crater sections, but not where to put them or how they should be implemented. So a, a 90 degree crater could, you know, goes between two walls. A, you know, you could have craters that loop along the flat section of a wall with blank number of segments from high to low. Um, you could have a full round, you know, a number of crater sections from a high to a low limit. Um, but we are talking about like every time a team walks into, um, you know, a, a building for a tournament, that tournament would be played on a field that would look a little bit different from the, the last field that they land that they went to. Just like every time you land on a space rock, it's going to be different. Um, and I was super gung ho about this. I thought it was going to be super awesome. And I think it was a little aggressive for uh, everybody else. Um, so obviously we didn't end up going with it. 
Um, but, you know, having the, the creator sections the way that they are, we do get to kind of play with and experiment with some of the, the different things. Um, the, the shape of the crater and all those sort of things. And um, yeah, we, we had a bit of fun kind of maneuvering those different, you know, things around. Yeah, that would have been like, that would have been really crazy, <laughs> but really awesome as well. So, um, Zach uh, six at E6 asks, was the zip zip dial solution inside the crater a thing you designed beforehand, a legit thing, or was it an afterthought because of the issues you saw? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Uh, so the zip ties inside of the lander, was that like a solution you designed from the beginning or was it kind of an afterthought? Nope. Um, <laughs> we we loaded the crater, uh, or sorry, we loaded the lander up and it, it worked well. It had a pretty good uh, solution. Uh, it had a pretty good weight capacity. It was a little bit above the, the the single robot weight limit um but we did not really have enough confidence in it to be the be all and end all solution and, um so really quickly like late in the summer um we were you know we, we it all kind of came to a head and we were like okay we we gotta we gotta do something new and um ben one of our interns actually he was the one that you know we were ping-ponging a lot of ideas around and he came up with the idea that you know if we just we have this handle bracket if we put that on the inside um we've got these big huge zip ties they carry 175 pounds we can zip tie this thing together and call it a day and, and you know we can get the load capacity that we need so that was definitely something that um you know happened late in the uh design phase but i mean we we tested it out it was a really well working solution um, and ultimately, outside of some much more expensive solutions, it's probably like if we had all the time in the world, it's probably one of the solutions that we would have come up with and gone with because it's good and it's cheap and it works. All right. A couple last questions here. Um, and, and I apologize because there's going to be a couple we don't get to. Uh, so Ian's uh, 13752 asks, uh, are the blue lander panels supposed to have flexible folds? I don't know anything about that, so I'm not sure if that's something you nope. can comment on. <laughs> All right. Easy enough. Um, I, I'm going to ask the next one here, and then we'll take that the last one that's on there, then, Ethan. So, uh, Phil McJoe, 234, I wanted to know uh, if you think defense of the craters will be a major part of the game, or does that play into the game at all? Maybe. Craters are open. You know, yeah. they're not red or blue specific. So, um, they're nice and big. You can easily fit two robots per crater. So, um if you can defend a crater then i think you can create a little bit of havoc so i'm gonna create a um, robot that just expands through the entire crater and nobody nobody can access it perfect that somebody clipped danny's face in that by the way that was perfect so <laughs> it, it's a strategy yeah. um that would be a forum question <laughs> but so uh once one two eight nine seven nateless asks Will Andy Mark test the tile runner going over the crater edge? Or if you if you've already done that, I think it'd be an awesome way to show rookies what gets over it, and some really cool marketing material. I think it would be too. Yeah. So we are, um, you know, there, there's a lot of people doing um, like robot in a weekend or robot in three days um, or or robot in thirty hours. There's a lot of teams that have started doing that, which is uh, really really cool to see some of the stuff coming out. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support. Go to patreon.com forward slash fun FRC.